Hello, my name is Barry Bachman. I'm an apprentice at the Church of Christ University Center, and I wanted to thank you guys for listening to my thought. The idea that I want to share is this idea of waiting on God, or waiting in God, really. Um, we're going to take a look today at the story of David and Saul. Um, but if, if you guys are um, a sports fan, or, or if you guys are keep up, you're probably pretty well acquainted with this idea, right? We're always waiting on the next year, the next team. Um, if you're an OSU Cowboy fan, you are well acquainted um, with this idea of waiting, and you are well acquainted with the phrase of, well, there's always next year. Um, but today I want to talk about this idea of, it, um, of what it means to wait in God, and, and that really, as people of faith, um, we are people who are waiting um, with hope. That we wait, knowing that there's, uh, knowing that there's change on the other end, um, and so this this fits within this idea of tempo that we've been talking about lately. This rhythm that God has meant for us to live in, um, and this pace that God means for us to walk at. Um, but today we're really going to talk about how do we live whenever things go out of the way that they were supposed to be. What is the tempo and the pace that God means for us to walk in whenever things get disrupted, whenever there's disorientation and chaos in our world as there has been um, in a lot of times, and, and especially recently with, with COVID. Um, I think that um, Romans 8 testifies to this, um, this disorientation and this chaos that our world experiences when it says that creation groans in eager expectation um, for, for restoration, for, for God to make things right. Creation groans under the weight of sin and under the weight um, of, of death that, that sin has brought into the world. Um, and, and we feel the consequences of this. We feel it in, in sickness itself. Um, and, and so we're well acquainted with this disorientation and this chaos. But what do we do? How do we respond as people of faith? when we find ourselves in these moments. And so I wanted to look at David and Saul, and I want to look at David's life, how he walks through um, just so many challenging things, really. Um, how he has this great promise um, from God, how he's been anointed, how he knows um, he's coming to be to be king, yet he has to go on the run from Saul, right? And, and really, David's whole life faced a lot of disorientation, right? Like, um, from, from, I'm sure, hearing of, of the rejection of Saul by God and, um, and for Samuel to, uh, to then him being anointed, to David being anointed, right? And then um, being brought into to Saul's court to play, um, to play the harp, to, um, to fighting Goliath, to being made a commander in Saul's armies, um, to gaining, like, just absolute fame status that people were saying of him that that Saul is slain as thousands, but David is tens of thousands. I mean, he's being elevated above the king to being made a fugitive, right? He is now on the run from the king, all while he has this promise. He knows where he's going to end up. He knows the hope that he has, but that doesn't make the present any less real for him. And I think that we, in a lot of ways, are very similar, that we know how it's going to end. We know that God is going to make all things right, but that doesn't change where we're walking. And so how, as followers of Christ, do we wait on what we know God is going to do, and how do we wait in Him? How do we walk with Him as this goes? And I think that this idea of waiting, um, it reminds us of a few things, right? It reminds us first that we are followers, right? It reminds us that we don't um, that we don't take the lead, that we, um, we aren't charting our own course, but that we have a Lord who has walked before us, whose footsteps are trustworthy and are good, and we have somebody who's calling the shots in our lives. Um, and I think that this, this, is, uh, this is important as we look at the story of David and Saul, because I think in a, this is what, um, in a lot of ways, God was cultivating in David during these years of waiting, right? That God's not only... Um, He's not only going to make things right at the end, but he is a God who is at work today. He is a God that is at work in our lives um, here and now. He is a God who is at work shaping our hearts and cultivating us um, as his people. And so I think that throughout this story, we see God cultivating in David's heart 
this patience to wait and to surrender. Because we see Saul kind of go the opposite, right? In, in 1 Samuel 28, we see this instance where, where Saul inquires of the Lord and does not hear from him. And so he goes and consults a witch um, to call up Samuel. And and this is actually contrary to what God wants of his people. Saul has, has previously banished the witches and mediums from the land because this is contrary to what God desires. But in fact, we see Paul here go and do the opposite. We, we see him go and consult um, the, very, the very things that he's banished from the land. And so I think that, that we see God cultivating this waiting posture in David. Um, and, and really, I think what we see what we see God cultivating here is this posture of dependence, that we are a people who, who rely and who depend on the Lord, that we take refuge in him, that this, this in fact is the very place that we are meant to live. We were meant to trust God. We were meant to look to him. Right? And I think that this is why it so naturally fits for us as a waiting people. As followers of Christ, we are a waiting people because we know that the world is not how it is supposed to be, right? And, and I love this because not, our waiting, um, you can wait with, with no reason to think that things are going to change, but that is not how we wait. We wait because we have confidence that things will, in fact, change. We wait because we believe that God is going to change the way that things are. We wait because we know that God will make all things right. And that is awesome. That's a super... Um, beautiful thought to me, um, just this, this um, declaration that our faith is, this declaration that our waiting is, that it's not something that we, we don't have another option, it's because we know that our God has it, we know that our God has got it, and I love this, as I was thinking about this idea of communion, that we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes, right, this until he comes, that our communion points to the fact that our Lord is coming back to restore all things and to make them right, that we proclaim this resurrection. I love that. That is what our lives point to. That is what our waiting points to, is for people who, who we know God's going to make things right. And so we're waiting on Him, but we're also waiting in Him. Because in the midst of this waiting, God is doing something, right? And I, I love this, uh, this verse in Psalm 63, 3, when, when David, um, David says that, that God's love is better than life itself. Like this is, the, this is the testimony that David gives on the backside of all these years of waiting um, and trials, that David is able to say that he, um, that the Lord is his portion, the Lord is all that he needs. He's brought, been brought into this place with God that has sustained him and that has fed him that the Lord, um, the Lord has been all that he needs throughout his life. And we see over and over again this idea throughout the Psalms um, where David, David just makes this resolve to wait upon God. And so I love this because um, maybe you find yourself in a place where you feel like things are not where you want them to be. Well, I, I would encourage you to be in the Psalms and to see where, um, where David's heart meets God how David um, learned to walk in God and to wait in God and to depend upon Him. And I think that God in this and throughout our lives is cultivating um, cultivating more than just artificial and light worship. That God is taking us to a place where we are free to live for Him and to love Him and to give Him our whole self. Uh, in 1 Samuel 15, we, we, see, um, we see Samuel confront Saul um, because the Lord has given pretty clear instructions to Saul about how, um, about how he wants uh, them to treat the, the objects of, of war and plunder um, that, they've, that they've taken. Um, and, and Saul, he, he misses it. He doesn't do it. And so Saul tries to kind of make up this bad excuse of like, well, I, I kept these things that that the Lord said to destroy so that I could, so that I could offer, offer them to him. Um, and what Samuel says to him in, in first, uh, first Samuel 15, verse 22 through 23, um, 
Does the Lord delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as much as obeying the voice of the Lord? To obey is much better than sacrifice, and to heed is better than the fat of rams. For rebellion is like the sin of divination, and arrogance like the evil of idolatry, because you have rejected the word of the Lord. He has rejected you as king. And we see David echo a similar phrase in Psalm 40, verse 6 through 8. Sacrifice and offering you did not desire, but my ears you have opened. Obedience is what he desires. Burnt offerings and sin offerings you did not require. Then I said, here I am, I have come. It is written about me in your scroll. I desire to do your will, my God. Your law is within my heart. And I love this because this is actually a prophecy that Jesus fulfills. Right? In Hebrews 10, it puts these words in Jesus' mouth that Jesus came to do this. That Jesus came to, to replace um, these sin offerings and burnt offerings. He came as this perfect example of obedience that God desires of us. And to me, this is this ultimate, um, this is an ultimate just statement of God's faithfulness that in any season, wherever you're waiting, that we point to and we look to Jesus as God's example and provision in everything. That God has provided our deepest need. That God has made atonement for our sin. That he has met us in the place where we needed him to come through more than anything. And so we can hope and trust in him to come through in everything. Um, and so what What of this waiting? Okay, so so we we wait on God. And we trust him. What? So we just, we just wait around our whole lives? No. And I love this quote from C.S. Lewis. Um, it says, If you read history, you will find that the Christians who did the most for the present world were precisely those who thought the most of the next. It is since Christians have largely ceased to think of the other world that they have become so ineffective in this one. And I love this idea because this waiting, this trust that we have in God frees us up not only, um, not only to live with hope, but it frees us up to, to go on mission with God. It frees us up to be a part of what God is doing in our world. It frees us up to be a part of blessing others the way that God is about blessing others. It frees us up to give ourselves away for the good of the world.